Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. Jesus forgave us of all sin, past, present, and even future sin. Andrew brought good news to me. I could understand the Bible more the way he taught it. Jesus forgave you one time, and that's for everything. And now, here's Andrew. Praise the Lord. This is our Tuesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today, I have begun a new series. Actually, I started it yesterday talking about observing all things. And this is taken from a scripture that Jesus gave right before He was caught up into heaven. He's told us to go and make disciples. And then in Matthew 28, 20, He says, "...teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you." And I spent four weeks teaching on discipleship and showing that basically the church hasn't been making disciples. We've been making converts. And we've been telling them only about heaven and hell issues. We've been preparing people for eternity, but we haven't prepared them to live here on this earth. And so part of being a disciple is learning all things that were said in the Word, not only the things about going to heaven and missing hell, but instead we need to learn how to live in this life. And so for the next few weeks, I'm going to begin to start talking about some of those all things. And again, I can't cover all things in just a couple of weeks on television, but I'm going to deal with some things that typically are left alone by so many ministers today because they are so controversial and many people think that this is, you know, you're messing now with social issues. You aren't preaching the true gospel. The Bible has things to say about every moral social issue. The Bible covers everything. It says over in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse uh, 16, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. It says that the Scripture is given to make us perfect in all of these areas. The Word of God isn't only about spiritual things. Now, it does emphasize and major on it because there's a wealth or let me uh, rephrase that, an abundance of information about all of these secular things. And so there's plenty of information on that, but there's not a lot of inspirational uh, type information. So yes, the Bible is a spiritual book about our relationship with God and these spiritual eternal values, but it also has instructions on every single thing about how we're supposed to treat our mate, how we're supposed to treat our children, how we're supposed to treat co-workers, how we're supposed to walk in health, how we're supposed to uh, act on finances. It just has something for everything. And because the church hasn't been teaching to observe all of these things, and we've just limited it to this narrow scope about eternity and heaven and hell issues, well, then our society is just totally losing its moorings. We're moving away from all of the standards that have made this nation great. And when I say this nation, I'm talking about America, but this program goes all around the world. And the same thing is true all around the world. Societies today, there is a spirit of antichrist that is operative in the world and beginning to become dominant. And societies all over the world are moving away from the moral standards that have held society together for millennia. And we're trying all of these new things. And I'm telling you, we need to speak out on the Word of God. So the very first thing that I want to talk about, and some of you are going to be shocked with this, but I want to deal with what some of the things that the Bible says about creation. Because uh, I would say that it has become politically incorrect today to believe in a literal seven-day creation of the world. Six days work and one day rest. It's become politically incorrect. And even a huge amount of Christians will not admit that the Bible is accurate in this area. And by not standing up for what the Word of God teaches, it undermines the accuracy and the integrity of the Word. 
I've had relatives that have come to me who are Christians, and they love God, but they say, you know, the Bible, it isn't literal six day of creation. It took billions of years and all of these kind of things and all of this. Well, that does not fit what the Bible has to say. Let me just use one passage of Scripture right here that makes this so crystal clear that I don't know how anybody can claim to be a Bible-believing, and you trust what the Word of God says, and yet you still believe in this evolutionary thing where it took millions and millions of years for all of this to form. Look at this in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now somebody's thinking, what does that have to do with creation? Well, this says that death is the wage or the payment, the result of sin. Now, the Bible very clearly says that sin entered the world through Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3. If you believe in this long earth and long universe concept and that there were millions and millions of years and that life on this planet came from a single cell amoeba that has developed and done all of these kind of things. Well, if you believe in that, there has to be this cycle of death, and then the next generation, it somehow or another mutated and morphed and changed, and you have to believe in all of this cycle of death and regeneration for millions and millions of years prior to the Bible record of when Adam and Eve sinned. But the Scripture says, that death is the result of sin. Death could not have existed for thousands, millions of years prior to the sin of Adam and Eve because death came as a result of sin. And I could take... This is a simple, simple truth. But you could amplify on this and you could go back to all of the Old Testament sacrifices, and the reason that that death came was because when Adam and Eve sinned, the wages of sin is death. There had to be a payment, so animals had to be slain. God allowed us to substitute an animal, a lamb, and spill its blood instead of our blood. But all of this came because of Adam and Eve's sin. To believe in evolution, you have to believe that it wasn't Adam and Eve's sin that brought death in, that death existed for millions and millions of years prior to the time of Adam and Eve. That totally violates what the Word of God says. And again, I could bring dozens of scriptures to bear, but this is just so obvious to me. I don't know why we need to go much further than this. The wages of sin is death. Death came as a result of sin. If you believe the Bible, then you know what? You cannot believe in a millions and millions of years of death prior to Adam and Eve's sin. That's incompatible with what the Scripture says. That's amazing to me. But, you know, it's amazing also to me how very few people let the Bible get in the way of what they believe. Here's another real simple passage. Over in Genesis chapter 1, and in verse 20, and, and he said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind. Notice, after their kind. And every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them and said, Be fruitful, multiply and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and morning were the fifth day. And then on the next day, it says in verse 24, And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after their kind. And it was so. And in verse 25, it says, And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. Did you know that this is like six or seven different times in two or three verses that the scriptures clearly say that God brought forth these animals after their kind and told them to be fruitful and multiply and reproduce after their kind? You know what that means? 
That means that the species do not change from one species to another. They all stay after their kind. They all stay in their uh, group. You know, you can breed horses and you can make little tiny miniature horses. You can make huge work horses, Clydesdale and uh, Percherons and all of these. But you know what? They're still all horses. You can breed, and I mean men with all of their intellect and on tension instead of by accident. We can do things and manipulate and you can make some changes, but you'll never find a cow becoming a horse. You'll never find a dog becoming an antelope. It just doesn't happen. They stay after their kind. And yet evolution, see, is completely contrary to all of this. The whole basis of evolution is that we start out in just these chemicals. I always want to ask them where they got the chemicals from in the first place. There had to be some kind of a creator. But they just start out that you start with these chemicals, somehow or another lightning strikes that, energy is injected, it turns to a one-celled animal, and then this one cell, very, um, you know, unsophisticated one cell thing begins to start becoming more complicated. You know, this also violates what is called the second law of thermodynamics, and that is that we have an observable thing in uh, the world that we see, and that is that everything goes from order to a state of disorder. Things don't go from disorder to order. You can't observe that in anything. If you put an arrangement of flowers out, and if you, I mean, they could be fake flowers. They don't have to wilt and stuff like that. But you take some kind of an arrangement and you arrange them in perfect order and you leave them a hundred years and come back, they aren't going to be in exactly the same place. They go from order to disorder. Nothing gets better as time goes on. And yet evolution is all dependent upon a process that is unobservable in our universe today. Going from incredibly... Uh, simple to incredibly complex. It goes against everything that we have. Nothing gets better with time. It decays over periods of time. That's the way that nature operates. And yet evolution is dependent upon something totally different and it violates these principles. Death came as a result of sin. And everything reproduces after its own kind. I tell you, this is just so powerful. These are powerful truths. You know, what I would like to do is uh, we had Dr. Grady McMurtry on our program uh, two or three years ago, and he was talking about some of these exact same things. And I would like to just take part of that interview that I did with him and insert it into today's program. This is a man who is a scientist, has all of these degrees. He is... Um, you know, got all of the education in the secular things in geology and biology that I don't have. And here's this man uh, saying these same things from a uh, secular point of view. He's a Christian, but he's using uh, information in the geological record to say some of these same things. So I'd like to cut that interview in and use him to amplify on some of these points. Give us a little bit of introduction. How did you arrive at being a creationist? Have you always believed this? No, I have not. Uh, there are a few Christian scientists who, who have always believed in creation. However, in my case, as in most others, I started off as an evolutionist. I actually grew up uh, in the California Berkeley uh, area, uh, on the campus of Cal Berkeley, going to public school there, learning evolution in the public schools, because that's all they taught in the 50s but also would spend my time in the paleontology laboratories at the University of California, Berkeley, learning about dinosaurs, fossils, and evolutionary theory as a child. Mm -hmm. And I learned about them so well that by the time I was eight years old, they already started borrowing me from one classroom to the other in the California public school systems to teach the other children really? about dinosaurs, fossils, and evolutionary theory because I knew more about it than the teachers did. So you've had an interest in this since you were a very young child. Well, I've had an interest in science always. And of course, because I was only being taught one side of the issue, you know, education requires being taught both sides. Critical mm -hmm. thinking requires being taught both sides. Mm -hmm. What's going on in the public schools now is exactly what was going on in the public schools then. They're teaching only one side. It's indoctrination. It's not education. Propaganda, really. Well, it is a form of propaganda. And I do call it that myself on occasion. Uh, however, I went on to go to high school in Washington, D.C., earned a Bachelor of Science at Tennessee, a Master of Science at State University of New York as an evolutionist. 
So my science degrees specifically are as an evolutionist, and I believed it, and I taught it and to so others. And so what were those science degrees in? What was the The Bachelor of Science, field? well, you have to understand that in, in my case, they're very general science degrees. Mm -hmm. Some people specialize. My speciality is being an expert generalist. <laughs> Well, it so, gives you a broader view than a person that's, that's trained just it. in just a narrow thing. And, of course, some people would say, well, he only knows about this or he only knows about that, but he doesn't know about this. Well, that's not true. I know about this and I know about that. So in the medical terms, it'd be like you're a general practitioner rather than specific. I'm not a specialist in the sense that you would think of medically. But by the same token, I have in-depth knowledge in all areas. Mm -hmm. And I can stay current at all times, both in evolutionary literature as well as in creation literature. But I, I would go on then to teach evolution from the seventh grade to the university level. However, at the age of 27, I was challenged with was the evolution that I had taught others and so forth true or was it not? I became a Christian and uh, I would go on to get a doctorate, uh, it's called a doctorate of divinity, with a speciality in creation science. I would go on to, uh, just a year and a half ago, get a doctor of letters. So is it this uh, challenge to your evolutionary theory that led you to become a Christian or were those... Actually, separate? it was the other way. Um, and I think it's typical that uh, first at the age of 27, I was challenged simply, was Jesus telling the truth or not? That's an ancient argument. You know that as well as I do. It's mm -hmm. been around for 2,000 years. Uh, the fact of the matter is, though, that it's a simple question. And uh, as you might gather, I've got some academic scholastic skills. So I simply attacked that question from a purely analytical, scholastical position. Uh, because I've been around Christians all my life, but at 27 I simply said for myself, enough's enough. Either Jesus is telling the truth, He is the Son of God, or He's not, period. Mm -hmm. And so for six months I did a self-guided study. Although, of course, I look back on it and say, well, the Holy Spirit was guiding yeah. me. But at the time I was not that aware of it, okay? Mm -hmm. So for me it was a self-guided study. I didn't have anybody sharing across a coffee table. I didn't have anybody saying, here, read this or read that. I simply took a look at the Bible. I took a look at the histories that are outside of the Bible and so forth. And after six months of diligent study, came to the conclusion that Jesus was telling the truth. And awesome. so in a room entirely by myself, the Holy Spirit being present, but no other person, mm -hmm. I decided to become a Christian. That's a good choice. And I you know, so it's, it's, I think it's a really good point that you're making too, that uh, Christianity isn't just a total leap of faith in the dark. If you really analyze the facts, it leads to Jesus being who He said He was. So what did this do to your evolutionary model when you became a Christian? Well, that's just it. Um, first of all, I knew so a little bit about Christianity. I went to an associate pastor at a church near where we lived and explained the story of, of what had happened in a longer way. And he said, so your decision is firm. And I said, if you knew me, you wouldn't ask the question. And he said, okay, and then he simply showed me about making it public and being baptized, and, and I was. But of course, that left me with a huge, huge problem. It simply made me a saved evolutionist. Mm -hmm. Now I'm smart enough to know I've got a problem. So what I did was I spent 16 additional months of simply evaluating the question, had God used evolution to create what we see around us? Was everything that I had learned okay and taught others was okay? Or was what I had learned and taught others wrong, and that in fact God had really had created it 6,000 years ago, as it says in the Bible. And at the end of 16 months, I came to the realization that there's absolutely no science whatsoever to support evolution. All good science proves creation. Well, now that statement, I agree with you 100%, but our viewers are sitting here thinking, wait a minute, this is an absolutely proven fact. All of the well, evolution stuff. Evol evolution, first of all, there's no such theory, no such thing as the theory of evolution. Yeah. Literally, if you had a million evolutionists in a room, you'd have a million different theories. They would all agree it's true, and no two would agree what it, it really happened. And the fact of the matter is, by the time they got through the room, the first guy would change his mind. Mm -hmm. So first of all, you have to realize that, that there is no such thing as the theory of evolution. There are many. Secondly, they've never been proven. That, that's an absurdity. As a matter of fact, most evolutionists would have to agree if you push them hard enough. It's not really been proven. What it is, it's a philosophical construct. That evolution is not accepted scientifically, it's accepted philosophically. But it is spoken of and that it's a proven fact that They're, this is happening. Because they have the floor. They've got the pulpit, so yeah. to speak. They have the bully pulpit. And what they do is they simply, because this is what they want to believe, they then yeah. promote it to others because they want to have company. 
Well, I think that this is a point that really needs to be emphasized as we start into all of this, that w we are countering the theory or the theories of evolution, but it is not proven fact. Matter of fact, the facts prove opposite. Absolutely. And after 16 months, I came to the conclusion there's not one law of science, there's not one natural process, and only some of the physical evidence that could be used to support evolution, whereas every natural law, every natural process, and all the physical evidence supports creation. Well, now, Grady, I'm really interested that when you became a Christian, you immediately saw a conflict here. So it would this be accurate to say that if you truly embrace evolution, is it an anti-God concept or... Uh, it, why did you pure, all of a sudden see this conflict? Well, see, the pure, pure evolution is absolutely atheistic. Now, there are those people who would call themselves deists. There are those that are theistic evolutionists and so forth. There's different gradations. Mm -hmm. However, if you truly believe 100% evolution, you cannot be a Christian, period, because true evolution is atheistic. Hodges at Princeton back over 100 years ago sa said that evolution is atheism. That was his simple blanket statement after reading Darwin and analyzing things. And that's exactly correct, because true, pure evolution says there is no God, period. That everything must be naturalistic, mechanistic. There can be no outside creator, designer, God, no outside intelligence of any kind whatsoever. So those people who are Christians and believe that evolution has occurred in the past over millions and billions of years, we, we lump them as theistic evolutionists, that God used evolution. But this is not an acceptable position. Mm -hmm. If one simply looks at it, one realizes the conflict. But the fact of the matter is that if you believe in an old Earth, old universe for any reason, now there are different theories of why this right. was. You're familiar with gap theory, mm -hmm. day age theory, yeah. framework theory, and so forth. I've got friends that teach that gap theory, and we've discussed it, and yet they love God, and yet they still believe in that. Yes, but it's a theory that only came into existence in 1813, I agree. I agree. you know, by Chalmers. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely wrong. And you can prove it being yep, wrong. I believe so. And that's just it. My point is that all you need is six things to prove that any old earth view is inconsistent with Christianity. Because if you believe in any old earth view, you're destroying the cross. Mm -hmm. You see, if you believe in any old earth view whatsoever, you're saying God's not omnipotent. He's not omniscient. He's a liar. He doesn't always have a witness. He can't save a remnant. And death occurs before sin. If that's true, take the book of Romans and tear it out of the Bible. That's well, a very simple point. In my, in my view, I'm uh, probably more simplistic than what you are. You sound like you approach things from a super logical way. But from my view, the Bible says it happened this way. Evolutionist says it happens another way. And you immediately bring the whole of Scripture, not just Rome. I mean, everything from Genesis on is in question. And that undercuts a person's faith. There's no way for you to be strong in faith if you don't believe the Bible is infallible and inspired by God. Well, see, without creation, without the doctrine of creation, there is no Christianity. Because you find this throughout the entire Scripture. If you start not just with Genesis... But if you take a look at, for instance, John chapter 5 or Revelation 14, 6 and 7, it is creation, which is the foundation of Christianity. Without mm -hmm. it, there's no Christianity. God made them male and female. They didn't evolve. Also, you know, it says that every, every species was supposed to bring forth after his kind. And evolution is based on all of these things evolving from simple to complex and it just totally goes against the whole concept that Scripture teaches. So well, that's, I, I that's think it's it. totally incompatible. If evolution is true, you have common ancestry. If the Bible is correct about creation, then you have created kinds. And mm -hmm. actually, that's what we find consistently throughout with science. And concerning the age of the Earth, there are over 270 what are called geochronometers. Now, geo, like geology, geography, mm -hmm. means Earth, matter, universe. Chronometer, of course, is a timepiece. It's a Timex, it's a Rolex. So a geochronometer is an Earth time clock or a universe time clock. There are over 270 of them that we have today going towards 300. Because we actually are finding about one new one per month these days that show that it's all young, perfectly mm -hmm. consistent with 6,000 and proving that the millions and billions of years did not happen. But think about it for just a moment as to why an older Earth view destroys the power of the cross. Because if you do believe in millions and billions of years, the only reason to do that would be to believe that life and death have been going on for millions and billions of years. If that's true, death is common. And human sin didn't cause it. And so the death of one man on a cross is meaningless. I've never thought of it from that perspective, but that's very good. 
Whereas if you understand creation correctly, that God started everything perfect, put Adam and Eve there, gave them the right to mess things up, they did. Mm -hmm. And because of human sin, death came into the universe. Then and only then can you understand how the death of one sinless man on the cross can atone for the sins of the world. And so mm -hmm. if you believe in an old earth, you're destroying the power of the cross, period. Yeah. You may not realize it. And I'm, yeah. I'm not saying that people do it intentionally. Yeah. Most of them do it without thinking. Most of them do it because they've never been presented with the information that they would then think it through. On today's program, Andrew interviewed Dr. Grady McMurtry. For more information about Dr. McMurtry and his ministry, go to creationworldview.org. Throughout this series, Andrew mentions many statistics and scriptures with regard to creation versus evolution. These references, as well as others pertaining to abortion and homosexuality, have been compiled in the Observing All Things booklet, which is Andrew's free gift to you today when you write or call. I'd like to encourage you to get this material. You know, this is different than what I typically teach. I normally just teach straight from Scripture, but we've incorporated into this interviews with doctors who have all of these credentials that can speak to the subject of creationism in a way that I can't. We also have this little booklet that comes with it that has charts and graphs along with scriptures on social issues such as abortion, homosexuality, creationism. This is just, it's a different type of teaching than what I typically do, but it is very powerful. I really felt impressed that I needed to share this with people. These are hot issues that affect us today. So listen to our announcer as he gives you information and please get these products today. Andrew's complete teaching titled, Observing All Things, is available in either a CD or DVD album made from our daily television broadcast. Each of these valuable resources is available for a gift of any amount when you write or call. This entire series is also available for audio download absolutely free from our website. Go to awmi.net to see all the ways you can get this teaching. We want to say a special thank you to the Grace Partners of Andrew Womack Ministries. Your gifts make it possible to put free ministry materials into the hands of many people in need. If you're not already a Grace Partner, we ask you to pray about becoming one today. You can become a Grace Partner or order resources through our website at awmi.net. While there, you can discover more product details and download additional free resources. Or call our helpline Monday through Friday from 4.30 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. Mountain Time at 719-635-1111. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today.